chose, what would we do? We would choose all the good stuff, and that'd be bad for us. You know, it's like everybody likes to eat flour, but no, you know, you know, nobody likes to eat flour, but everybody likes to eat cake. And we proved that last week because we ate a giant sheet cake, right? I don't think I don't know if anything went home. And and, and he likes to mix these ingredients together, and he likes to make everything beautiful in its time. And he thinks that you are beautiful. He really does. And, and you know, he, we we learned last week that he puts eternity into our heart, and and, and that. And into my heart, and, to, and, and he creates mystery in life, which is great. And, and, and that produces faith, which only he can give us, and, and faith being the thing that pleases God. So the author of Ecclesiastes would say, so what do you do with, in light of this, that things are, you know, things are good, and things are well, and, and you've got money, and, and, you've, and you've got food, and you've got love, and he says, enjoy life. The only verses in the Bible I, that I know of that say that. Enjoy life. The guy who's experienced everything, everything there has to do, says enjoy life. And he says, when, and, and just drink it deeply, laugh hard, and enjoy it. And, and, and when things are going bad, and things are hurt, and there's no money, there's no food, and you're eating ramen noodles three times a day, I've been there, right? And when you're doing that, and, and, and things are hurting, and there's no love, cry hard, look to God, and enjoy life. So here's what I want to do with, the, with our time this morning. I want, I want to answer his question. Not, not my question. I didn't make this up. And he asked the question twice. And, and he, it's the same question. He asked it again. And I, I, we're going to go through that. But he rewords it. And then we're going to answer it. And to do that, we're going to jump all over the Bible today. We're going to be everywhere. So if you, if you, this is a good day to take notes. I talked to a few before the sermon. If you take notes, this is your day. If you're a note taker, get on it. Here we go. All right, so we're going to start in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and we're going to be in verse 16. And it says this, Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness, and in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. Now here's what he's saying. If this is true and God sends what God sends, then my, here's my question. What do you do when places that are created for goodness, places that are created for righteousness, but there's no righteousness there. And we, I, honestly, I can give you the big example I got, and that's the Catholic Church. We see that throughout that whole church, the whole thing, the way it's set up. So you have the court system, you have marriage, you have the church, and what happens, all these places that God creates to be safe places, and, and they're not, they're, they're created to protect us, they're created to, to not end up being, and they just not, they're not safe. What do we do? And I'm, and, and I'm not going to address that today, I'm going to address that next week, but it, it's, it's because chapter 4 covers that, and, and we'll get that. But it's the same problem that we have with, with, with the philosophy of living. But listen to verse 17. It says this, I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. He addressed it just very quickly by saying, God's going to handle it. God's got it. Don't think you need to do anything. God's got it. And, and it, it, if not in this life, you know, and you see people, billionaires, who live their whole life doing things. And, and, you know, Mr. Olstein, I always say that. My best life now, right? And, and it's not there. It's not what it is. But he'll handle it either in this life or in the next. And in verse 18, he says this. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. Are but beasts. So here's what Solomon's saying. At the bottom level of all things, we're just dumb animals. That's what he's saying. And, and, and there's, we're no better than them, right? I mean, if we're concerned and threatened, you know, we'll do the same thing that an animal does. If we're backed into a corner, what are we going to do? We're going to fight, right? And, and you know, or we, we'll either run or we'll attack, or if you're a guy like John, you're going to slap and run, right? Sorry, John, I had to throw it in for you. I wake you up. It's kind of a hybrid of the two. John is, you know, he slaps and runs. But he doesn't feel like a coward. I get that. It's just a hybrid. But so, listen, really, we're no different than animals. You're either going to run, you're going to fight, or maybe some other alternative, hybrid. Verse 19. But what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast. For all is vanity. And do you remember what the word vanity means? Yeah, 
meaningless, worthless, yep. Now, this goes kind of contrary to what you've been taught, right? It goes kind of contrary because we've been taught that we have an advantage over the beasts, right? I mean, we ha what's the advantage? Anybody, what's the advantage over the beast? Opposable thumbs, right? That's the advantage we have. So here's what Solomon's saying. You're going to die, you're going to die with the, and that, that thumb that you have is going to rot the same way that their claw is going to rot. That's what he's saying. And who cares? Really, who cares? Because, it, it, you, you know, you've got this great brain and we can fix stuff and we can build stuff and, and, and they build stuff. Beaver builds a dam, right? I mean, they build stuff, they do. And, and you know, you can fix stuff and you all, and you got all these things and when it's all said and done, you're going to die just like Bootsy the dog. I use Bootsy because I hope nobody uses, has a Bootsy the dog. Or, you know, maybe Gilbert the hamster or, hamster or whatever creature, animal, your grandson or kid got you to buy that you don't really care about anymore, right? And they're, they're going to die. But it doesn't matter because in the end, there's no difference between you and the animal. Both are going to die. That's the, that's the perspective he's saying. And you've you got to look at the next line. All go to one place. Now, we've got to chat about this. We've got we to gotta chat. They're not talking about heaven and hell. He's talking about one place being the grave. Listen, I don't know whether Bootsy is going to go to heaven or hell or gets judged or has to repent or not. I don't know that because really, to be honest with you, there's nothing in the Bible that, that clarifies that. I don't know what happens to Bootsy. So don't hate me. I'm just telling you I don't. Here we go. All are from the dust and to dust all return. We've heard that a few times, right, in our lives, some of us. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. And here's the question. Here's his question. What happens to a man when he dies? That's his question. Hang with me. What happens to a man when he dies? What happens? Does he go up? Does he go down with the beast? What happens to a man when he dies? Let's look at verse 22. It says this. I saw that there is nothing better then a, a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Now here's the same question again, reworded by Solomon. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? Same question. So we've got to chat about this Old Testament versus New Testament thing. And this is where you get this. Let me talk to you about the relationship between these two big hunks of books, right? It, basically, what happens in the Old Testament, New Testament relationship is the Old Testament ask the question and prophesies, and the New Testament answers the question. That's what happens. So the Old Testament paints the picture, and the New Testament explains the picture. And that's where we get that. The Old Testament prophesies and, and makes promises, and we see that all through the Old Testament, and the New Testament promises are fulfilled. And so what we, what we got to do is, to answer Solomon's question this morning, what we got to do is, what happens when a man dies? That's his question. The, you know, there's, and there's four main things that, that people think. And we've talked about these before, but I just real quick want to go through them. The, four main lines of thinking. Number one, least popular, but in this day and age of 2019, is growing, it's growing, is that when a man dies, nothing. Nothing. Done. That's still the most least popular. But I'm telling you, in this United States of America, it is growing that people don't want there to be a God, and they think nothing happens. And, and he just dies and nothing, it's over, it's done. And in the days you walk the earth, and that's it. That's, that's, it's the least popular one. When you die, nothing happens, no heaven, no hell, no nothing. You just cease to exist. But it's gaining popularity. In, 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 but it's not what the majority of men and women think at this point in, in time. That, and, and here's the second view. And, and this is, we talked about this before too. When a man and a woman die, they come back in some various form of something right for the next time around because they got to right the wrongs that they did in that previous life so maybe they come back as a man maybe they come back as a butterfly maybe they come back as a flower right and and they got to right the wrongs that they did before and, and and they'll continue on this cycle until they nail it and then they get nirvana and that's reincarnation and that's what they actually believe they'll continue in that cycle right and this is a very, very popular view. All of India, all of, of, of that area over there believe this. That's why you see the cows running around, because they're afraid if you butcher one and have a steak, you just ate your mama. And that's a true story. 
they, they don't kill certain animals because they think you reincarnate into them. And it's nastiness over there too, right? And then you have this. The majority of the world, and I think this is the third one, every religion outside of true biblical believers, outside of that, you know, including vast amounts of people in this country, Pentecostals, um, right down the line, they, they, they think that you have to do something to earn your salvation. That you have a part of your salvation. You had something to do with it. So in other words, you will die, you'll go stand in front of a deity, and he has these giant scales, and if you did more good than you did bad, then you you got it. You're in. And, and it's the truth. They, I mean, they chase that all around. That's why they're constantly, constantly, you know, doing these things that, that they want to bring things to God. And it's just nonsense. It's unbiblical. And, and I'm not just pointing at them. I'm just saying. But, you know, when, when the scales finish and the good outweighs the bad, then you're going to get some kind of reward in front of this deity. Now, I'm not here to talk heaven and hell today. I'm not here to do that. I'm here to talk about the process. Just the process, right? You want to talk about heaven and hell? I've done that in the, in, over the summer in, in two or three different sermons. It's there, right? I'm going to, just a little bit, but, uh, you know, you, if you do more good than bad, and you're not going to get some kind of reward. Instead, you know, if you do more bad than good, then there's punishment. And that's the thing that, they, you know, it's kind of iffy there. It may be eternal. Maybe it's just for you a thousand years. This is the crazy stuff. Fifteen minutes, depending on how much, how much you weighed good and bad. I mean, they still think there's some kind of a blend in between. They, they, they try to, you know, force it around. Could be like the Japanese. They use two different kinds of religion. One doesn't have an afterlife, and one does, and they blend them together so that when they die, they actually have an afterlife, and they have two religions. That's the way they. That's the way it's done. And there's just massive biblical issues with all these. And the problem is the, the you know, with the first idea that nothing happens. That listen, it's the greatest gamble in all the universe. That nothing happens. I mean, I'm a risk taker for some things, and I'm conservative in other things. And, and, you know, I, I tend to jump in feet first sometimes, and I tend to be conservative in other times. But, you know, I, I just can't put my head around some of this stuff, you know. If, you know, we, we probably, you know, I'm the kind of guy that says, well, we should read the instructions first. If somebody says that, and I'm saying, no, give me the hammer, let's go. Or at work, I'm like, nah, we're going to wait, we're going to do this, we're gonna do, uh, and, you know, we're going to do this. And so I'm back and forth. But listen, that's not a dice I want to throw about there being nothing there. I don't want to throw those dice. Because if you're wrong, you're wrong. And here's the problem with reincarnation. That no one remembers what they wronged the last time around. You know, here you are, that butterfly. You reincarnated into a butterfly. What would you do wrong as a butterfly? I mean, or you reincarnated into a cow. You know, what do you remember? They don't, you know, how are you going to remember what happened? I mean, if you, it, it, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's like... Me, it's like me having you play ball and, and throwing you a baseball out, and, and here comes a major league, you know, you're going out and you strike out 27 guys and go up to the plate and hit, hit four home runs, right? It's not going to happen. That's the perfect game, and that's what they're expecting. There's no instructions. You know, I don't give you anything, and nothing happens. And, and how, how can you know even what happened in the previous life? And every once in a while, you'll find this guy, he goes, you know, I remember what happened in the previous life. I was a drifter in China drinking tea when, when a ladder fell on my head and, and I got killed. And then I reincarnated into, a, you know, a dog. You can find that on the Internet. And every once in a while, you'll have this crazy guy that remembers, right? He remembers, and most people who believe in that doctrine of reincarnation will tell you, I have no idea what I did in the previous life. I have no idea. So how do you right the wrongs? How do you balance the scale? How do you know? How, how, how do you know what the score was? It's, it's kind of gut-wrenching when you think about it. So here's the problem with, with our, our real popular, you know, most major religions ascribe to works-based or, you know, I did something for my salvation, you know, or the scale model. All the same thing. They're all the same thing. The scale model, it's broken. It's broken more than the other two combined. And, and, and if you put the good here and the bad here and, and outweigh them, and, get, and, and God, you know, that makes God unjust and wicked. Because God will judge the sin. There's no court in the world, no matter how wicked or depraved, that will be able to operate like that, or they'd be overthrown, right? I mean, 
Here's why. When you break the law, let's say, you're, let's say you go and you jaywalk, right? Let's say you jaywalk. And, and, and you know, or, or, okay, may, let's say you do 102 in a school zone, right? <laughs> Get the gas going, let's go. Got the Mustang out, 102 in a school zone. You break the law, what's going to happen? You're going to incur the wrath of the police, and then somebody's going to judge you and send you to jail, right? And if they didn't, what would happen? What would happen? I mean, think of, don't think of wrath as much as getting struck by lightning or, or, or something like that. Think of wrath as just opposition. It's opposition. And that's what wrath in the Bible is. It's not, it's not being struck by lightning or things. It's, it's, it's sometimes God will do that, right? But it, it, it's opposition, and that's all the word means. It means a steadily building opposition against. So when you break the law and there's opposition against you because you broke the law, now you go to court and you and, and you know let's make this bigger, right? Let's let's say you're guilty of, of of rape and murder, and the judge goes, you know, rape and murder, that's that's fine, and and let's look at the rest of your life and see what you did. Now the Democrats today might say that'd be okay, would we agree? But but let, let's look at the rest of your life. You know you know you had no priors and 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 you coached little league and you were just a really good guy, but you know the rape and murder thing, mm, uh. You know, your good outweighs your bad and your infraction, and, you know, I think I'm just going to let you go. Now, would that judge be just? Would he be just? Would he be righteous in any way? I mean, that might fly in California or New York, but in Ohio, you're gonna get, that judge is going to get shot, right? Or the guy's going to get killed that did it. I mean, you don't just go outside and do rape and murder and, and say, well, you know what, he was a classy guy. No crime unpunished. If the judge does not judge wrong, then he is completely unjust. And that's how our God is. The scale model doesn't work because it makes God wicked and evil because he didn't judge the, the bad. So God just can't throw everything on a sale, scale and, and click and wait for it to outweigh and, and ignore the bad side. It, it makes him a wicked God. It makes him who he says he's not makes him not perfect. So the question is, what happens when we die? So how does that work out? And, and you know, a lot of people believe that, you know, that they help God with their salvation. So here's what I want to do. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to hear what the Bible has to say. And I'm going to use different scriptures. And I, and I want you to see what the Bible says, and I'm going to jump around a little bit, but I'm going to answer Solomon's question, what happens when a man dies? And to do that, I'm going to start in Romans, and I'm going to start in Romans chapter 5. I'm not going to probably read all the verses. The majority of Americans believe they're going to heaven because they're good enough. You guys see that in society? I'm good enough. I, 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 my good outweighs my bad. And I'm telling you right now, I personally can't see that in my own life. That, that makes God unjust. And, and, you know, some of the other issues that you have is, you know, if you reincarnate, how do you know the score? How do you know what's good, where you're at good and bad-wise? Even if you've got skill, skill issues, even if you think that you helped God do this, how do you know the score or where you're at? You never would know that. I mean, you're, and, and then the other thing is, you're always going to find somebody worse than you, Right? I mean, if you can't, you're in an insane asylum. I mean, look on TV, watch the news. Well, you know, I'm bad, but that guy there, look at him. I mean, if you're not in here and you can't do that, then we're struggling here. All right, let's go see what Scripture says. Romans chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 12. And it says this. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man. Anyone know who the one man was? Adam, correct. You know, it's kind of funny, right? Eve, Eve picked the fruit, Eve ate it, and who does God blame? Adam. Right? That's a whole other sermon, right? It says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. So here's what happens. Sin enters into the world, and through this little fiasco of Adam and Eve eating an apple or whatever fruit it was, right, the DNA of the universe is fractured. The DNA is fractured. 
and, and, and in such a way that everyone born of Adam, which is everybody here, from that moment on, has sin from the day they were born and that you're broken. And all of us know that. At one point or another, we all know that. So you got to get this. Sin is not a state of actions that occur once you know the difference between right and wrong. Did you get that? Sin is not a state of actions once you, that occur once you know the difference between right and wrong. Listen to what sin is. Sin is something you were born with. You were born with and those actions later on are a symptom of the problem. Because preachers love to say, you know, this is sin, and this is sin, and this is sin. That's the way I grew up, man. Everything was pointed out that everything was a sin. But see, listen, when the blood of Jesus covers your life, that sin is gone, and he only sees the blood of Jesus, his righteousness. We'll get into that later. And if you're not a believer in here, and you're, you're kind of snickered when I, when I said something like that, you know, maybe somebody drugging you and say, hey, let's go to brunch. And then they brought you to church, right? And then they threw you a little Debbie snack cake and said, hey, let's, you know, let, or, or donut. We had good donuts today, you know, and, and, and maybe, maybe, you know, you didn't believe me or maybe you do. You know, the entire world, listen, every talk show, every magazine, everything out there is trying to fix things. Do you agree with that? Every talk show, I mean, we wouldn't even have bookstores anymore. Dr. Phil wouldn't even have a show anymore, right? I mean, he, he, there wouldn't be any bookstores because 80%, get this, 80% of the books in a bookstore are trying to fix you. So the world knows that something is wrong. The world knows. Okay, we know Adam and Eve bit into this apple, and that's why things are all kind of messed up, and that's okay, but, you know, you've got to admit that there's something horribly wrong, and everybody's trying to fix it, but really, have they made any progress on it? It's all to no avail. I mean, Adam brought sin into the world and fractured the DNA. He did. That's where sin came from. And you and I are broken, and we have to understand that. And that's called total depravity. You need to understand that. And, and we'll talk more about that at the end, but, but you know, it, it, I'll give you some evidence about that a little bit. All right, let's, let's look how God fixes it. If because of one man's trespasses, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who give the abundance of grace, who receive the abundance, and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So death reigned through one man, and much more of those who will receive the abundance of grace. So sinners enters into the world through Adam, fractures the DNA, it creates a groove in the soul. We talked about that last week. And, and that only eternity can fill, that only God can fill, and we try to throw those temporary things in there, and it just clogs it up. In order to, to take care of that bad side of the scale, something has to absorb that wrath. Something has to absorb that wrath. And, and remember the brutality of what happened to Jesus. If you've ever seen the, the, the movie uh, with, I can't even remember the movie, um, the one where Jesus is beat and, and bloodied, and it's Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. If you've ever seen that movie, then you've seen, and that is Jesus absorbing God's wrath. All of that happened, all of that wrath, all the eight of those beatings, all of those, the crucifixion, everything that was there, it, you know, it, it, on that bad side of the scale was removed by that Jesus drinking the cup of God's wrath for those who would believe. And on, it's for those who would believe in Christ. And all of this will accumulate on the day of judgment. And now this is where you get your church words, heaven and hell, right? But we're not, we're not going to dig into that too much. I do want to say one thing. You know, heaven is very much a mystery. And, and I always get a little bit nervous when I hear somebody say that they've got it. You know, they've got it. We, this is what heaven is. And this is what hell is, right? Because listen to what 1 Corinthians 2 says. But as it is written, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. So nobody actually knows what heaven's like, because you can't imagine it. Nobody knows what hell's going to be like, because you can't imagine it. And people ask, do you think that hell is a burning lake of fire, that an angel's going to throw you in? I do. 
I do think that. I mean, I don't know what kind of fire, what kind of, I'm not trying to scare, I'm just telling you, there's something there, and maybe you'll cook for billions and billions of years. I don't know, but I'm telling you, it, it, what, what the scripture is very clear about is that hell is the absence of God, and God is everything good and perfect. That's what I do know. God's not there. Now, that's the big picture, and here's, here's what I want to do just very, very quickly. I want to take you through the process of what happened. So in order to do that, we got to go to Romans 8. Love Romans 8. Love it. You and I were born sinful, broken, born that way, fractured DNA, everything's horribly gone wrong, and then we get to Romans 8, and we're going to start in verse 30. So I'm going to keep saying this. We're broken, you're sinful, you're all messed up, I'm messed up, we're born that way not a series of things that happen later in your life. You're born that way. Now look at verse 30. To those whom he predestined. Now, it's a big church word that most people just skip this verse. They skip it. I haven't really talked about it a lot, but I just want, I just want to be clear. Predestined, because a lot of evangelicals will say predestined doesn't mean predestined. It means that God looked through time and seen that you would be good, and then he said he predestined you. That's not true. Predestined means predestined. It mean, it, it, it's, this, this, it's a piece of this puzzle of, of salvation. It's a piece of it, right? And, and predestined means predestined. And, and it's just a piece. And I'm not going to address it today, but I promise I will. All right, look at the next one. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And that's what I wanted to get to, the call. So you and I are sinful, we're broken, we're fractured. The DNA of the universe is split, shattered. Christ comes, he dies on the cross. You got justification in life, and you and I are in the middle of life somewhere. We're in the middle, think about this, you're in the middle of your life somewhere, and then you hear the gospel call. You hear it. And here's what happens. Somebody tells you about Jesus. Somebody tells you about Jesus. And maybe it was in church, maybe it was a buddy, maybe it was a book you stumbled upon, maybe somebody gave you a goofy cartoon track, or, or you read, and you read through it, maybe you saw a guy on TV, you heard a guy on the radio, maybe it was your parents, you know. But listen, the gospel call went out to you. And, and I can tell you that the majority of the people in this church have heard the gospel over and over. I mean, Someone tells you about Jesus, they tell you about the cross, they tell you about forgiveness, they tell you about repentance, they tell you about faith. And someone tells us, they tell us, they tell you, the gospel call goes out. Somewhere, somehow, we hear about Jesus. But listen, millions of people, millions of people are told about Jesus. But the Bible is very clear that only some really hear the gospel. I'm going to show you today. Let me show you. Go over to Acts 16. Acts 16, our boy Paul, he's sailing, he's sailing from Troyosis, and he's headed to Tyrathyra, and he's, and, you know, he gets to Tyrathyra, and, you know, we've all vacationed there, right? We've been there, it's cool. And, and he starts preaching to the masses of people. He starts preaching to thousands of people as soon as he gets there. And, and you know, I want you to see what happens, because the gospel call goes out to everyone, but you can see very clearly, very, very significantly what happens. So we pick it up in verse 14. He's preaching, and listen to what happens in verse 14. It says this. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia. And, you know, Paul speaking to this massively huge crowd, thousands and thousands of people, but they're only talking about one lady. That's it. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Tyrathyra, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. So here's what we know. She's, she's going to the tabernacle. She loves God. She's, she's a very wealthy lady. She's dealing in purple goods, which is very rare back in the day, right? You know, I don't, I don't think I have too many purple shirts. But, you know, it's it, very, very rare. And look what the next line says. This is huge. Listen to this. Listen to what it says. The next line says this. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what Paul was saying was said by Paul, or what was said by Paul. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention. So Lydia finds herself in a room, or in a, in a wherever, just like you are today, and 
instead of Paul, it's me. Too bad for you, because I'd love to hear Paul preach. I'm sure there's others of you would too. And he's, he's standing up and he's preaching and he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about, you know, how Jesus works. And, and, he, and, and, and he's done and, and what, what Jesus will do for you, and he, and he saves, and what he can do, and he's talking about all these things, and Lydia finds her mind not wandering. She finds herself dialed into what Paul's saying. She doesn't feel tired. She's not a skeptic, and for whatever reason, God puts it in her heart, and the text says, opens her and gives her the ability to deeply pay attention to what is being spoken. Opens her and gives her the ability to pay deep, deeply to pay attention to what is being spoken. And what happens in this moment is all of a sudden, and, and, and most of us in this room have been there, all of a sudden is what theologians call regeneration. Our hearts open. We can hear the gospel. We can hear it clearly. We're, we're not wondering about anything else. We're not worried about what's going on in the room. It's just that one thing. And maybe you're going, oh, come on, Jeff, that's just one place. Well, let me take you to another place. Let's go to John 1. I'm just, I just want to throw this out here, and I apologize for saying this. I said you can accept Jesus a couple weeks ago. Listen, there's not one instance in this Bible that says that I accepted Jesus. It said that God called them every single time. Look at it. Study it. See the, see the verbs. See the words. It says God called them to salvation. That's why it's not about you. So over in John 1, we are broken, born evil, DNA is fractured, we're living life, somebody throws out the gospel, here it is, coming out, somebody starts to talk about Jesus, talks about talking to God about it, he starts talking about the cross, and what happens is we submit our lives to him, and, and, and what, it, what it means is we repent, right? We, 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 what faith is, you know, repentance and faith, they're all gifts from God. They're all gifts from God. There's nothing about you, and they, and they start to unpack that for you, right? And, and for some of us, and we hear it, and we're completely unmoved by it, some of us are unmoved, and some of us are hearing it. We hear it. Others of us, you know, it just clicks. It clicks. The gospel clicks in our hearts. Let me show you what this is like. And this is frustrating for people because, you know, We've had people who we know that have passed away and they just kind of said this little prayer, but and, and then they fall away from Jesus and there's nothing there. And I would say that you need to look at that, right? And you know, it's so frustrating because all of us at our very core, we, we want control. We're all co control freaks. Whether you're that artsy woman that shows up 50 minutes late, so you're not, or 50 minutes late, so you can be cool, or you're that, you know, anal retentive guy that shows up 50 minutes late, so you have, it's all about control for us. I will control. But look at this. Look at this. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. So, so watch this. For those who heard the gospel message and responded to it, this is how it works in verse 13. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, born not of blood, not of the will of flesh, not of your own will, the will of man, but of God. So my question that you should think on, and I'm not going to go into this today, is do you have free will? The Bible's pretty clear right there that it says it's of the will of God. So God, as the gospel goes out, opens the heart of a man or a woman. Pay attention to grasp it. And then, you know, we've all done this. I did, you wrestle it, you know. You don't, I don't think at this moment that we're talking about a conversion person. We're talking about regeneration. We're talking about somebody that's being wooed into things. It's simply, we're talking about all of a sudden, our spiritual appetite, our, our, just our focus wants to be on God. It's an increased on things. We're indifferent about things that are, you know, historically, all of a sudden, we begin to really, really wrestle with things in our life and in our heart. And, and, and let me just give you my story, right? You know, I heard the the gospel just a million times growing up. I, I was a church boy. I started church at four. I can remember praying a prayer when I was four and asking Jesus into my heart. And I can remember praying a prayer when I was 15. And, and I remember all these things that went on. You know, my, you know, all my life, everybody had told me about the gospel. 
but I don't know if I actually heard it until a guy came on the radio one day in 2006 and told the truth about the Bible. I don't think I actually heard it. You know, I'm riding in a car in Lansing, Michigan, and I hear a guy talking about salvation be all about God and God alone. And I heard it like I'd never heard it before. The gospel call hit me like a ton of bricks, and, and I couldn't get enough. I couldn't get enough. I mean, I was listening to the sermons. I, I was praying. I was reaching out. I was challenging people about things, and I was, I was asking questions. And all that legality that was in the churches that I was in was just... It just came to surface, and, and, you know, you have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this, but that's not what the gospel's about. It's about God and God alone. I mean, we can play this game, right? You, can, you, know, you know, I had this guy who played this game, and this is what he said to me. He said, you know, so what you're saying is a virgin gave birth to God in the flesh, and then he prays to himself, and he's, he's perfect, so they kill him because he's perfect, and then three days later, he comes back to life, and then he floats up to heaven, and one day, he's coming back on a horse. That's what he said to me. Oh, do I have all the pieces right? I said, yeah. Yeah, you pretty much do. And he's like, I have all the pieces. I mean, you know, that sounds kind of cuckoo to me, right? And it made to you. I mean, and that's what he said to me. He said, everything was okay. I was okay with the virgin verse up until the horse thing. The horse thing kind of threw me off. So if you're hostile and you're completely indifferent, you know, and then all of a sudden, in an instant, God does something in your heart. He does something in your heart, and you can't stop it. You can't stop it. All of a sudden, spiritually, you, you know, you just feel like anorexic and starving and, and anemic because you need more and more and more of Jesus. You know, I just began to ask questions. I began to listen to sermons. I began to frequent things all the time. I mean, to, you know, to listen. I wanted it to be very clear, and it was. God made it very clear. He reveals himself to you if you ask him to. All of a sudden, things change. You know, I'm reading some books. I'm wrestling with things. You know, I'm trying to disprove things. All the while, God's inviting me in. And that's the regeneration process, I I mean, and it could take a very long time because it did for me. It took maybe 15 years. The gospel call goes out and God begins to open the heart. He regenerates the heart and all of a sudden we care. All of a sudden, the things the pastor's saying, they stand out to you. Or historically, they may not have cared. And all of a sudden, you care and you want to figure it out. Is that guy telling me the truth? All the process, you know, was prophesied. Did you know that? It was all prophesied in the Old Testament. Thousands of years before Jesus, before he even showed up on the scene, the Old Testament makes a promise that the New Testament fulfills. So watch this. Go to Ezekiel. I'll give you like six or seven minutes to get there. I can tell you it's to the left of the New Testament. You have phones, so it won't take very long. But I want you to see this. I want you to see this. It's a little bit different language, but you need to see this. This is God. But tell me that this doesn't sound familiar to what the New Testament says. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. I will, gi I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you heart of flesh. So you follow me with this? This is exactly what we're talking about. Exactly. I mean, all of a sudden, you're wandering. All of a sudden, you're searching. All of a sudden, you start going to church, and maybe historically you were hit and miss, or, and, and you know, you, you start talking to your buddies about, you know, who are religious. You start talking, you know, well, you want to figure it out. And I guess it's a lot of you in here, you know, this morning, either you know Jesus or you're somewhere in this path of regeneration. Otherwise, I don't know why you would be here, because I told you this is a lame hobby coming to church. It's a lame hobby. Otherwise, I don't know why you would be here. I mean, you've got some level of this, right? And some of you are, I can see where you're at. I can see that you did the searching. You've chased Jesus, and you're chasing him, and you understand that you have nothing to give him. You ever notice when people pray like this? You ever know why they pray like this? Do you know? 
because they have nothing to give God. This is what you offer him. Nothing. You offer him yourself. That's it. You have nothing. And, and, and even the life that you have with his, all of a sudden you're searching. And I'm guessing that, that you're here because you want to know Jesus. And I'm guessing that. You know, unless your neighbor passes you and said, you know, until you said yes, right? It could happen. But you're still in here, and you're hearing the gospel. And you're somewhere on this line, you're walking, and I'm trying to get to you to find, I'm just, I want you to think about yourself and find out where you're at. So let's finish reading this. And it says, And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules. Now, are we ever going to get there obeying all those rules? Anyone? No. Never. All of a sudden, the gospel call goes out to sinful men, and God opens our hearts so we're able to hear it. And, and somewhere in the middle of this regeneration process that, that happens in an instant, or maybe over a long period of time like me, or... or or we begin to walk, we want to please him, we want to please Jesus, we want to walk in his ways, we want, we want to it, we, it's the start of faith that God is giving you but it's for him and God and God alone and God's glory alone and all of a sudden we're, we're doing right things we don't even know why we did that but we're doing it quite don't understand but there's a fullness. Remember what Ezekiel was talking about? He wants to find the fullness of God, and we want, we want to find the faith there. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we want to please him, and the process of regeneration leads to what we call conversion. And I want to explain conversion to you, because regeneration leads us to a place where we understand sin. Sin creates sorrow. Sorrow leads us to repentance and faith, and that's the path that God leads us on, to repentance and faith. Those are the gifts that he gives us recognize that you and I were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were dead. And God gives you sorrow of your sin, and he gives you faith. Now let me try to explain repentance, because I think it's done, been done really badly, and I'm going to put it up on the board. I may have heard this. Repentance is a term that means you walk one way, and then all of a sudden you turn and walk the other way. How many of you heard that? Let's, let me tell you something. If that's the way it is, I've failed. I have failed miserably. Because I'm going to take three or four steps back, and my long, freakishly long arms are going to reach back and grab something and pull that up with me. Is it just me? So the definition is of what required for salvation is, you know, you want to go 180 and walk this way and never touch anything back there. Listen, I'm out. I'm out. I can't do it. So I want to put up what I think repentance is. So here's what I think repentance is, and I think it's coming up. Is it up? Repentance is a sorrow over sin that creates an earnestness and a ferocity to know Jesus deeply. To know Jesus deeply. And when that's our pursuit, when we're running towards Jesus, when we're running to him, you know, the stuff starts fading away. The stuff and the trinkets and the toys of life and the things of life, they're all fading away, and then we just see Jesus. You know, i, I, I got to stop doing this and, and quit moving on. And, and we don't even know why sometimes. Why did we stop? We don't even know. I mean, did you hear what we just read in Ezekiel? I'll put in your heart. I will put it in your heart. You come to me, and I will put my statues in your heart. And let's be really clear here, because, you know, at Apex, there, one of those things that we like to say over and over again is that this is a place to, to not be okay, and I want you to believe that. It is a place. But listen, the only thing is, I don't want you to pretend. Don't pretend anything. If you struggle, come on in, man, because all the rest of us do too. We struggle. You know, I'm not wearing a cape. I mean, <laughs> I'm not wearing a cape. I mean, you could shoot me right now, right in the chest, blood everywhere. Just don't get it on my wife, because she'll get mad at me after I die. Right? I'm dead. I mean, the, the older I get, you know, I have these, what, what's called these dark nights of the soul. Anyone? 
you wake up in the middle of the night and God's talking to you through your mind and he's, and he's, he's bringing scripture into your mind and, and, and things are going on and, and the older I get I just tend to believe if you, I don't really trust people that don't have nights like that because I have them all the time and, 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 but here's one thing when you preach like this and, and you kind of create this culture where you need to confess your sins you need to clean you need, to, you need not to pretend you need to fess up who you really are what happens is the end is, is that some of the guys and girls think that's the end of it that's not the end of it. We, we think that once we do the confession part, that that's not the end of it. What do you think it is? It's the beginning. It's the beginning. You come clean and don't pretend. And I blew it. I blew it again. I feel better. And, you know, I got that off my chest. Woo! I'm out. Gone. No healing. No steps toward Jesus. Take that sin away. I mean, it's, it's kind of off the rails, man. It's off the rails. Repentance and the faith that Jesus can save is what you need to lean on. Stay with me. I promise I'm almost done. I broke my promise. I was only going to go 40 minutes. There. Oh, this is the first time this whole year. Okay, dead in our trespasses and sin, fractured DNA, the gospel call goes out, God awakens, awakens the heart, regeneration leads to conversion, repentance and faith, gifts from God and, and in that moment you're justified you're right before God God calls you righteous that's where we're at and then you start this wonderful process called sanctification it's just a blast it's, it's a process where God's going to chisel away at you he's going to chisel away at the things that you do and then one of two things happen. Number one, after this, Jesus comes back on that horse, right? Or you die. You know, every generation, every one of them, since Christ, since he ascended and in, in, up into heaven, thought they were the last one. Even Paul and those guys talk like they were the last one, right? Every generation. All of them pointed towards the Middle East to prove it. Listen, he could come back tonight. He could come back tonight. But listen, I think there's a good chance that you and I are going to die before he comes back. But you've got to have hope in that. He's coming back. I think there's a really good chance that we're going to fight for every breath, every breath that we can to stay alive, and then we're going to die you know, I could be wrong. Maybe the microchip is the mark of the beast from, from Revelation 13, right? I could be wrong. But eventually, you know, eventually somebody's going to get it right, right? Because they're going to point to, oh, look at that Middle East. It's going on. And then Jesus is going to come back and one generation go, yep, we got it. We were right. But I think if you just look in the Bible and understand that everything's been a mess since Ishmael, everything, and that's Genesis. That's in the beginning of Genesis. Everything's been a mess. There's been no peace. Study history. And, and, and I hope peace will come. So now, this brings us back full circle to the, one, to the question. What happens to a man when he dies? John 5. Let's answer the question. DNA is fractured. Gospel call goes out. God awakens the heart of regeneration. Regeneration to hear, to care, to move that leads to repentance and faith and salvation and then sanctification begins which we all love until we die until we die John 5 we're going to pick up in, in verse 25 and there's a, just a, something here I'll explain to you and listen to what Jesus said truly truly I say to you an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Now, he's not talking about physically dead people here. He's talking about, you know, what we've been preaching about for the last 40 minutes. That spiritually dead people will hear his voice, and they, and they will hear his gospel. Spiritually dead people will hear it, and they will live. Read on. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. 
and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. And, the, and verses 28 and 29 are going to answer the question, what happens to when a man dies? They're going to answer this. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. So now we're not talking about spiritually dead people, we're talking about dead, dead people, right? So do not marvel at this, an hour is coming when all in the tombs will hear his voice. All who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of life. So here's what happens. And a lot of people have a question on this subject, right? We question it. And usually it evolves around because it's a chronological timeline. And the moment your eyes are closed, are you in heaven or do you have to wait a little bit? Or is it like it, it's like when you go to sleep and you set your alarm clock and you don't even move for nine hours? Is it like that? And a lot of people believe that. And we've talked about this in Revelations, and we talked about this before. When I went through Revelations last summer, you know, um, it, some people go, no, it's just kind of like that. And, you know, I kind of, this makes me weary to hear people say that. Because, listen, God stands outside of time. He's not inside of time. He's, opera- he's not operating under the same rules that we operate on. And there's no boundaries for God. There's no, there's no rules for him. And you and I operate in the past, present, and future. And God operates outside of that. And he's standing there waiting for you. He's already in tomorrow waiting for you. He's already in tomorrow waiting for someone. So you got to get your head around that. So the you know, we got to cognitively get in your head around this chronological timeline that when the God of the universe doesn't have to obey that, but we do. He doesn't obey it, but we do. You know, the, and I, I love this. And you need to read the book of Mark chapter 8 and 9 and 10. And and I've said this before, and I firmly believe this. Mark says that before your eyes close in death, as a Christian, basically, that the righteous will not die. The righteous will not die. And what I believe happens is that second before you die, if you believe in Jesus, he shows up and he goes, Hey, you want to get up out of here? You want to get up out of here? A second before you die, you want to get up out of here? You know what? I've overcome death. I've overcome death. Now, I know death's coming, but I've overcome it. Let's get up out of here. Let's go. What are you going to say? What's going to be your response? I'm going to be, let's go home. Let's go home. That's how I think the timeline operates. There are two judgments. For the believers in Jesus at the resurrection, God you know, walks over to the scale. He looks at the bad side, and he sees what? He sees the blood of Jesus. He sees Jesus' righteousness covering that. And he only looks at the good, and the good is what? Filthy rags. But they're Jesus' filthy rags. And Jesus walks over, and he says, paid in full. Paid in full. And that's what happens in this parable of the sheep and the goats where Jesus says, you feed me, and we don't know when we see him and when we do see him. That's why we go on mission trips, right? They're filthy rags, and those who are outside of Christ, God doesn't consider the good. Because in order to be just and right, he only considers what you've done wrong. In the same way for the believer in Christ, the bad is not considered because of the blood of Jesus. And those outside of Christ, the good is never considered because the judge job is to, to, to judge the infraction and the wrath. And I know you're tired and I know that I wanted to get through this. So here's my question to you. Before you head off into lunch, you're not going to beat the Baptist there, I get it. Before you head there, where are you at on this line? Is your heart stirring? Do you want to know more? Do you not care? Are you indifferent? Do you want to understand more? Is there, been re, you know, where's regeneration at? Listen, I, I can tell you that there used to be, you know, this thinking that at the exact moment you got to know exactly when you were saved. And, when that, and that's just not true. Because a lot of people, 
or in a process of being saved. But my question is, do you hear the gospel call? Has the process of regeneration even started? Are you in the place of repentance and sorrow of your sin? One last verse, and we'll close. Matthew 7, 13 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy and that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So my question is, where are you? I pray that you would wrestle some and talk. And so what happens when a man dies? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the men and women that are here, and I know they've endured a long term over there. I thank you for the endurance that you give them, and I pray that their hearts are open. And I think I know that we're all over the place in here, Lord. And that's probably my favorite part of this place. And I know that some of us have already, you know, we have loved ones that have passed on forward to a day, and we're looking forward to seeing them again. And I know some of us, for the first time, we've, we're really hearing the gospel. And, and I really don't know what to make of that, and I really don't know what to think of that, but it's, it's in your hands. And Father, I pray that you would do the thing that you did with Lydia open our hearts to want to work on it and want to wrestle with it. And I pray that those who have been wandering and questioning, Lord, that you would give them that. Because you overcame them. I think you, in the end, we are not stuck trying to accumulate enough good deeds. I thank you for that. That we never told you. Never knowing whether or not we did enough. But instead, we pin all of our hopes on the pleading of the death of Jesus Christ. I pray that we would wrestle and we would fight in our own minds this week and we wouldn't just turn it off. I pray in Jesus' name. sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now am found was blind but now I see it was great that taught my heart to fear in grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing promised good to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life 